Rachel Bomberger with Erdman's Publishing, and I'm sitting here today with Adam Coleman Marshak. Welcome, Adam. Hi, thank you for having me. Okay, first off, tell us about yourself. Um, I, uh, I'm a teacher, a history teacher at Gann Academy, which is a non denominational uh, Jewish high school in Waltham, Massachusetts, which is just outside of Boston. And um, I have been uh, there for eight years, and I have uh, an amazing daughter and one on the way. We don't know yet. Jenner, but uh, Congratulations. We'll find out. thank you. Um, and my wife Melissa is an attorney in Boston, and we live in Newton. Um, and uh, this has been my life's work for since my sophomore year in in college. It was when I started working on Herod. So it's it's really it's nice to finally have it come out in in, in yes. print after more than a decade of of, of uh, working on it from one small term paper that I thought was, eh, you know, mildly interesting to a dissertation and an honors thesis before that and then finally the book, so. Okay, I can see you're really eager to talk about the book. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about that. Um, yeah, so, uh, like I said, I started it as, um, in sophomore year of, of college, I, um, I was taking a Roman history class and my professor said, well, you know, write a, write a term paper and I, I had known a few things about Herod, and I thought he was mildly interesting, and he looked like he had an easy source, Josephus, which turns out not to be the case, but <laughs> that was what I thought. <laughs> and I said, all right, I'll write a, I'll write a seven, ten page paper, whatever, that'll be fine. And then um, I really got interested in him because I think he's one of the most maligned characters uh, of the ancient world, you know, I mean, Augustus he starts it with this quip, I'd rather be Herod's pig than his son, and... Uh, <laughs> Which, you know, it's, it, it's a good joke, especially if you, if you get the kosher part. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and because of the Gospel of Matthew, he really just comes off as this awful, horrible, pharaoh, you know, um, every nasty character you can think mm. of. And I was attracted to him, not because I necessarily wanted to whitewash him, but because I found, as I got into the reading, that... He certainly wasn't a nice guy, but he didn't seem as bad as everyone made him out to be. And the question was, well, why? And so that led me to um, my honors thesis in, in undergrad, which was um, a much shorter version of what, what actually is the book, um, and then led me ultimately to my dissertation. Uh, and, you know, I think in the end, my, my response is Herod was not a nice guy, but he wasn't really nastier than anyone else in the ancient world. And in mm -hmm. fact, in many ways, at least to certain people, and of course, surprisingly, given his reputation to the Jews, he was actually a pretty good king. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really the point of the book is to say, look, um, we need to get beyond this kind of New Testament view, this thing popularized by movies and the passion stories and the you know Christ Christmas narrative, and really get to how did this guy succeed? Why did he succeed? And what you end up with is a really astute guy who managed to do something that very few people, very few of his contemporaries could do, which was survive mm -hmm. and actually thrive. I mean, he survives multiple Roman civil wars. Uh, so that's really why I find him so interesting. Mm -hmm. And so the title of the book is now all those, this work leading up to this sure. great project. So the title is The Many Faces of Herod the Great. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I think that that really captures this idea that he is this chameleon of sorts, this political chameleon who, you know, is able to be the prototypical, the client king par excellence to the Romans. He's able to be this, you know, um, this pious, powerful Hellenistic king to his Hellenized non-Jewish subjects, his Hellenized non-Jewish courtiers, his Hellenized non-Jewish uh, neighbors. And then he's able to be the pious Jewish king to the vast majority of his subjects. Um, and, you know, one of the things that uh, Josephus does at times a good job of is make it seem as if the Jews as a whole would have hated the man. Mm -hmm. And look, I'm sure a lot of people didn't like him just like a lot of people don't like their government now. Yes. Um, but, uh, you know, it just as one uh, short piece of reason why I think that a lot of Jews would have liked him more than we would think. He provides lifetime employment for multiple generations just simply with the renovation of the temple and that's one project. I mean it's a big project mm -hmm. but it's one. So there's Caesarea, there's Sebaste, there's all of this temple building, all of this city building um, and you know if you're a stonemason life's pretty good. I mean better than what it was before. 
So, uh, you know, I, I think that he's able to kind of um, maneuver and present himself in the way he needs to to each and every one of his audiences. And so what the book does is it talks about how his personality and his persona change. His, the term I use is political self-presentation. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> which, you know, I haven't seen before, so I'm going to claim it's mine. Um, <laughs> it might not be, but I, I, I came up with this as this way of saying, look, it's not really about who he was. It's about who he was in the public. And, you know, my analogy that I used when I started this, which might not be re as relevant anymore, was, uh, you know, our former President uh, George W. Bush was really good at presenting himself as this kind of common American who would go chop wood at Crawford and go, <laughs> well, he, he didn't drink because he was a recovering alcoholic, but when he, you know, that someone you could have a beer with. Right. And, you know, I would say that was vital to him getting elected, well, maybe elected in 2000, but certainly re-elected in 2004, um, you know, that, that that kind of persona. And so in the same way, I think Herod's persona and all three of these audiences helps him stay, um, you know, in charge. Mm -hmm. I find this kind of political drama to be really, uh, really engaging. And what makes Herod even more interesting is, I mean, Judea is a hard place to govern. Yeah. It's a hard place to govern now. Um, so, and he manages to do it. You might say that the, the legacy of an effective ruler is does he leave the country better than he found it? Sure. Judea is, when the Hasmoneans are in charge, Judea is a minor backwaters principality that's, you know, allied with Rome, but is basically a, a battleground between first Seleucids and Ptolemies and then various rivals within the Hasmonean family and then, you know, various uh, Roman uh, dynasts. And Herod really takes control of it and solidifies the kingdom and makes it probably, you know, brings it to its greatest territorial extent of any historical Jewish king mm -hmm. uh, and makes it uh, economically successful, um, at least during his lifetime, and uh, builds the rebuilds the temple, makes it the largest sanctuary site in the ancient world. Um, rebuilds the largest artificial harbor in the, in the, in the Roman world, which is Caesarea Maritima. Uh, so in that regard, I think he certainly leaves the kingdom better than he found it. And more to the point, I think the diaspora does better with him. I mean, we know that he represents Jewish interests all over the Eastern Mediterranean, which is something that Jews in the Mediterranean didn't have prior to this. So one of the things that I say in the book is, is that, you know, he really becomes he transforms from king of Judea to king of the Jews, mm. which is, I think, a real big difference. Um, and so, you know, I think that in many ways he does leave the kingdom better. There are problems. I mean, there are definitely problems. He's no saint. No. The <laughs> funny thing is, if you look at the history of the Seleucids and the Ptolemies in particular, I mean, they're all murdering each other. This is, mm. a, this is why it's probably not a good idea to be a king at this time, because you're probably going to murder your wife. You're probably going to get murdered by your kid. Uh, if you're not murdered by your kid, you'll get murdered by your second wife. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe your kids will fight it out and duke it out and murder each other. So, you know, it's, it's, a, pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty violent world. And in that regard, I think, and this is, I think, the point mm -hmm. that, you know, I think what we need to do as historians, um, because it really is our job, is to say, look, this is who these people were. I, our job is not to necessarily judge them or, or to, um, you know, say whether they're morally, uh, they're people we should admire. I mean, I don't think we should, I don't, I, I'm not holding Herod up as this <laughs> role model um, of human behavior. Uh, but, you know, the, the ancient world was a brutal place. It was a nasty place. I mean, I think that if you watch, do you watch Game of Thrones at all? Uh, no, but, but you I know about it. Yeah. yeah. So who doesn't? <laughs> I mean, I think Game of Thrones, what's really good about the TV show is that it captures this very brutal nature of the way that power works mm -hmm. in this kind of world. And Herod has to do a lot of nasty things to get in, into power and to stay in power. Mm -hmm. um, but so do all of these guys. And so what we should probably do as historians is say, okay, let's set aside the fact that they're all probably not nice people and that they probably murder people they shouldn't. Um, how are they successful? Why are they successful? Because ultimately what I think is really interesting about Herod is that I think you can use this model 
of political self-presentation. I mean, I mentioned it with George Bush, you know, but you can use it with, with, with political figures uh, in other countries now as well. Do you mean that we could actually have something to learn from Herod the Great? Yeah, well, I think that there are a couple of things. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that one of the things we can learn from him is that, um, you know, if you're s clever enough and you seize the moment, you can, uh, I mean, he has no claim to legitimacy. He's not a Hasmonean. He's not a priest. He is an Ijumian, which at the time, you know, is, is not, there's a debate. I mean, Shia Cohen has this great book about, you know, where he talks about Jewishness. And, you know, the Ijumians are this group which I think are far more integrated into the Judean uh, ethnos than others have in the past. But there are this kind of, not, you know, there, is, there are Jews who don't see them as Jews. Um, because they're recent converts and they're, they were forcibly converted or not. Um, so he's a Jimian. His mother's a Nabataean. So, so his mother's an Arab. Um, he has n he's not a priest. He's not a, a Hasmonean. And yet, he becomes king. And so the question is, is how? Well, he does it largely through manipulating his situation. And I think that you can look at political leaders nowadays, especially political leaders who rise through the ranks and ultimately, you know, have a coup, um, a lot of these guys behave similarly. They start out as loyal courtiers, loyal subordinates, and they seize their moment. Um, you know, I also think that uh, one thing we can learn from Herod is that it's all about presentation. I mean, you know, I think Bill and Melinda Gates, for example, I think Bill Gates has done a lot of very good work in the last, um, you know, decade, and the Bill and Melinda Gates organization, is, a foundation is a wonderful charitable organization. Um, you know, but on the other hand, if you know, you, I'm sure you remember from the '90s when Bill Gates was, you know, was 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 the Antichrist with uh. Microsoft. So, you know, or Andrew Carnegie. You know, I mean, I think that presentation can affect the way we think about people and affect the way that we remember them. And you know, no Gospel of Matthew, Herod comes off looking very different. I mean, it's really because of the way, the central motif of the evil king, the pharaoh, mm -hmm. um, and the story of the slaughter of the innocents, that's really where you get this image of him as this bloodthirsty tyrant. I mean, Josephus has it, but it's not nearly as uh, vivid um, as Matthew. Matthew is a much better storyteller, I suppose. <laughs> I guess so. But you're a pretty good storyteller yourself. <laughs> <laughs> the book, again, is The Many Faces of Herod the Great. Author is Adam Coleman-Marshak. Thank you so much, Adam. Yeah, thank you. This is, this is really fun.